Good morning. Welcome to Our Redeemer. A blind man today is going to teach us how to see, that is, with eyes of faith to see our Savior, Jesus. This is the theme of our service. We'll begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. 
The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O oh Lord, our Lord, our Lord, Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you govern all things in heaven and on earth. In mercy, hear our prayers and grant us your peace all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. It is the Lord who gives life to our bodies, the Lord who gives life through faith to our souls. A lesson from Isaiah chapter 42. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The word of the Lord. Times are in your hands. Deliver. 
Faith expresses itself in love. A lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. The irony of today's gospel is that the 12 disciples couldn't see their Savior, while a blind beggar on Jericho's roadside couldn't take his eyes off of him. Such is the upside-down nature of our faith. Our Lord could tell the 12 men who knew him better than anyone else in plain terms that he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and to be raised from the dead, the most basic and central facts of our Christian faith. And St. Luke piles up three phrases to describe how blind and dense these men were. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. And of course, we are quick and easily fall into flogging the disciples for this kind of nonsense. We say, these silly guys, shouldn't they have known better by this point? Haven't they learned from Jesus God's ways that he's not going to march into Jerusalem with an invading army and might and power to save this world, but but that our God's way of salvation is for love with a capital L to lay down his life, the Lamb of God making his way to shed his blood for the sins of the world. Of course, we've heard this a thousand times over, right? Right? And maybe it's just in that that sometimes the devil finds a way for us to lose sight of the basic Christian facts of our faith, that Jesus Christ suffered and died and rose again. Well, you've heard it a thousand times over, right? And frankly, our hearts sometimes crave novelty. We want to hear something new. We say, okay, okay. Get on with it. And this gospel is chosen for this particular Sunday in the church year for a reason. Because we are about to begin the season of Lent this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, where we will gather together and our eyes will be drawn to Jesus as he makes his march to Jerusalem, as he suffers, as he dies, as he's raised again from the dead. The central basic facts of our faith and And before we flog the disciples, we ought to ask ourselves, do we understand these things? Have we grasped them for what they are? Do we hold on to them for dear life? Or are they just in one ear and out the other? That, I think, is a real danger, especially in a day and age like ours where our attention span gets getting narrower and narrower, shorter and shorter, right? Every day we spend hours in front of a screen that has vivid flashing images that change constantly. Sometimes what we see on the screen is good entertainment, and it draws us in. That's great. Sometimes the images are so horrible that we can hardly tear our eyes away, like what we see coming out of Ukraine this week. And some things on the screen are things we should never have been looking at in the first place. But you know that study after study has come out and shown that these are actually reformatting our brains so that we can't pay attention to anything for more than a few seconds. Our minds flip from one thing to the next. And as go our minds, so go our bodies. Our our lives are lived under a frantic, hectic pace, overscheduled, always living half in the present, half in the next thing, and half aching to return to the escape world of the screen where the whole cycle will start over again. I'm I'm talking about what life is like in a distracted age like ours. And, And I wonder how the basic facts of our Christian faith fare in such a day and age. You come here and you get your Jesus fix for one hour. You walk out those doors and then what happens? Do you remember the sermon from last Sunday? or the gospel, or the other readings from God's word? What kind of difference did they make in your life over the last seven days? And if the answers to those questions 
lead you to say, maybe I haven't grasped what was being said. Well then, don't start flogging the disciples quite yet. I fear that our vision of Jesus is dim. We catch only an outline like we're staring through the frost of a morning windshield. Of course, we know that we live by faith and not by sight. Back in catechism class, the pastor had you memorize a passage that goes like this. Faith comes from hearing the message. All the same, it's startling to encounter this reality lived out by a man who never once woke up to see morning light streaming into his bedroom window never saw the beauty of sunshine glittering in a thousand points off a fresh snowfall or the evening light glowing in the face of someone he loved. No, the man had eyes that couldn't see, couldn't see anything. He was blind. And yet somewhere along the way, a poor roadside beggar had stretched out his ears and received in them more than anybody had ever put into his hand, for he had heard about Jesus. We don't know what this blind beggar had been told. Perhaps he heard people talking about the miracles Jesus was doing, the way he was healing. Maybe they were, they were asking the question, could Jesus be the one? Surely someone who does such things must be the Messiah. Whatever it was that that blind beggar heard, it was the message And faith came through it into his heart and opened up his eyes so that he could see Jesus and Jesus alone. In fact, this is remarkable considering who he is and what his life was like. If you're a beggar sitting on the side of the road, no doubt much of your life is lived as you receive the pity and mercy from others in self-deprecating thoughts. I'm the sort of worthless person who has to beg. And that is reinforced by the spite and criticism that you hear from others as they consider you. Just ask yourself what you think of someone you see reaching for a handout. And you imagine the kind of scorn that this man received in his day-to-day life. But the message of Christ had been heard and the eyes of this blind man were opened so that he saw He saw things in a new light. He saw clearly that it was Jesus and Jesus alone, the son of David, who would be his savior, the one to have mercy on him. And so he was going to let nothing get in his way when news reached him that it was Jesus of Nazareth who was passing by Jericho on that day. Faith leapt into action. It silenced the self-deprecating voices inside his head that said he was a worthless human being, not worthy of anyone's attention, nor of God's. He tuned out all of the criticism and spite from others as they openly rebuked him and said, shut up. This is what faith does, right? It eliminates all of the distractions and it focuses his attention on Jesus and Jesus alone. It will allow nothing to get in the way between me and my Savior. And again, I suppose we ought to ask ourselves the tough questions. Do self-deprecating thoughts deny the truth of what my Savior has said about me? I'm such a worthless person. Really? When your God created you in his image, and redeemed you by the blood of the Lamb because you are so priceless to him? Will you let the perceptions and thoughts of others get in the way of your faith? Let me be blunt. If you are embarrassed to pray aloud before a meal at a restaurant, don't think that you have the kind of faith of this blind man who the more people told him to be quiet, the louder he cried right? The blind man's faith was so focused on Jesus that everything else was set to the side. It's Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And this man's faith 
received great things. But I'm not talking about the recovery of his sight. His faith met its object before then. In what I think is the most amazing verse in our gospel today, the one that really we should treasure and hold on to, that as he cried out, Jesus stopped everything. Jesus, who is on his death march to Jerusalem, who has on mind and heart the salvation of this whole world, and yet he will stop everything outside of that dusty little town of Jericho because of the faith that was residing within the heart of one poor blind beggar on the side of the road. And it's not just that Jesus stopped, but he gave this command. And of course, when Jesus commands, he always gets what he says, right? He commands the man to be brought to him. A remarkable moment as faith meets its object. And as Jesus fills the eyes and is the all in all. And at this point, let me break away from our gospel today to point out that at the 1030 service today, there's going to be a baptism right here. And what takes place at the baptismal font is so similar to this circumstance, is it not? Our Lord gives the command to parents. He says to parents, bring your child to me. And that's what's going to happen today. Parents in faith will bring a little baby to this baptismal font. And our Lord Jesus, who rules over the whole universe and who certainly has plenty of things to be occupying his attention, will stop everything and will give his undivided attention to one little child, saying to that child, you are mine today. I place my name on you. And you know what they say about infants, right? That they can hardly see. They can only see a few inches or or feet in front of their face. But there at the baptismal font, Jesus opens the blind eyes of the heart and gives that faith, that baby faith and sight that will see him now, that will deepen as that child grows and learns more about his Savior, and that ultimately will only be completed when our Lord Jesus raises that child from the dead and opens his eyes to see the light of his glory for all eternity. This is the treasure that is given at holy baptism, where the most basic and central facts of our faith, Jesus' death and resurrection, become ours. And the thing that marks out our entire life and opens our eyes to see everything in a new and different light. It's what your Savior has done for you. Great and mighty things. Of course, that blind beggar did recover his sight on that day. As Jesus' command was carried out and the man was brought in front of him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And this blind beggar made a preposterous demand. It's the evidence of his faith. It's something that would be utterly preposterous and unfair and rude to say to another human being. We know that with technology, doctors nowadays can do many things to help people see better. We also know that there are many kinds of blindness that are untreatable. And if you had an untreatable form of blindness, it would be a rude thing to go to a doctor and say, I want to see, you must make me see. But of course, this blind beggar realized that he was kneeling before his Lord, the one who created his body, who holds all things in his hands. And so he makes this great, big, impossible demand, I want to recover my sight Faith that sees Jesus in this light is faith that dares to ask for big things. It doesn't settle for asking for little trinkets. No, it asks for great big things that can be received only from our God. And I realize as I say that, that all of us to a certain degree must believe the prosperity gospel. There must be a part of our heart that believes that teaching that says, if I have faith in Jesus and if I ask him hard enough that Jesus will give me all of the things that I want, usually material blessings and material goods. I think there's a part of our heart that believes that, which is the reason why I find myself hesitating even to make this point and to say it, that the faith of this blind man would dare to ask for great things. It's just too easy for this crooked heart of mine to hear that and start running the numbers and doing the calculations and saying, gee, Lord, you know, I have some big things I could ask of you. No, I don't need a new $500 million yacht like Jeff Bezos. 
but I could use a little bit more. And well, I might not be blind, you know, Lord, I've got this canker sore, you could just make it go away right now, or whatever it is. Well, no, Jesus is not some on-demand doer of my every whim and wish. That ought to be clear enough simply from realizing that during the days Jesus walked on this earth, there was no noticeable decline in the number of blind people in the Roman Empire. He opened the eyes of a few blind people. No doubt there were thousands of others running around whose eyes did not begin to see. But I bring this up because I think that sometimes the opposite is way too true. That our faith is so clouded in its vision of Jesus that that we fail to ask him for anything but the smallest of things. That we don't lay our hearts and our lives before him. We cast our lives in terms of problems that I'm working to solve, of struggles that I'm trudging through and, and bearing up under, of weaknesses that I hope to overcome if I just keep striving at it. And if that's the way that we think about our life, then our vision is focused so much on ourselves that Jesus is only going to be invited along like some sort of third base coach who's standing there cheering us on as we hopefully round the corner and make it to home plate. But faith that sees in Jesus, in his suffering and death and resurrection, our life, our source of all goodness, both now and for all eternity, is, is faith that asks him for great big things. Not necessarily the wishes of my heart, but the wishes of his heart. Prayers like this, Lord, open my blind eyes to see more clearly what you have done for me. Lord, I want to see your glory. I, an unworthy, sinful person, broken through and through, unable on my own to make it close to you in your holiness. Lord, the sins that afflict me, they don't seem to go away. I do believe, help my unbelief. Lord, the suffering that I'm, I'm enduring is too much to bear. Help me. And what does your Savior say? He says, go. Your faith has made you well. Go. Your salvation has been accomplished by my blood, by my death, by my resurrection. Go. Don't you see you're marked at holy baptism to see my glory for all eternity? Go. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Isn't it remarkable that Jesus doesn't claim credit for the miracle of opening this man's eyes? Actually, what Jesus gives credit to is the man's faith. This is how much our God values and esteems faith. Faith which he himself works in the heart through hearing his message Faith which, as its first work, takes hold of Jesus. It's this faith that Jesus singles out on that day and says has made all the difference. It's opened that man's eyes. And what a difference it made. Now that the man can see, what does he do? He fixes his eyes on Jesus, and he follows after him, giving Jesus praise with his life. And through his praise, bringing others to praise their Lord as well. Indeed, faith sees everything in a new and different light. And this faith is God's gift to you and to me on this day. To clear away all of our distractions, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the thing that makes all the difference and that makes us who we are. Lent begins this Wednesday, and what a perfect moment for me to suggest that this should be a time of spiritual renewal for you and for me, for, for all of us. A time to come together as we follow our Lord and Savior to the cross and see him there give his life for our sins and be raised from the dead to overcome death and the grave on our behalf. It's a moment when we can, can put into practice what we see here, opening up our eyes and fixing them on Jesus and seeing him 
and him only. We have, of course, many opportunities to do so in this season of Lent, beginning on Ash Wednesday. We have Wednesday evening services, but it might be even more basic than that. Perhaps there are people who are watching this online who haven't come back to church yet. Lent is a good time to make that return. Not only are the cases of COVID going down, but we still offer here a Monday evening service where there's about 20 people spread out in this big sanctuary. Come back to church and see your Savior. Maybe there are people who have come to church, but not very regularly. Only maybe once a month or once every other month or once every couple months. Make Lent a time of spiritual renewal where you say, no, nothing is more central and important to my week than that hour I get to spend in, in Jesus and in his word to ground me so that I have a foundation on which to rest for the rest of the week until I gather again. Of course, we offer services on Wednesday evening, and we're offering extra Bible studies and way to, ways to read through God's Word and home devotion booklets, opportunities to come and confess a particular sin or vice that has been troubling you so that you might receive God's promise of forgiveness and, and be strengthened in holy living. You can find all of these resources for spiritual renewal in our announcements and at the Info Center. A moment for us to open our eyes and see the great treasure that is ours in a Savior who stops everything and gives his great command to bring you before him in his great grace to fill your eyes with what he has done in giving his life for yours. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning in our special prayers, we'll give thanks along with Bill and Faith Krug, who are celebrating 50 years of marriage. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Remember, Lord, your promise to be a rock of refuge for your baptized children Create in us humble and contrite hearts that we might always cry out to you for mercy. Fill us with your love. Grant us renewal by your Holy Spirit that we may always abide in Jesus Christ, our Savior, beholding his glory in his holy word and sacraments, being made well by the same and following him with joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember, Lord, the widows and the orphans, the lonely and downtrodden, the poor and destitute and our brothers and sisters in Christ who are shut in and unable to attend divine service with us. Be a mighty fortress to those who are sick, hospitalized, in treatment, undergoing surgery or recovering, and all those who are in need, especially those who are suffering from the terrors of warfare in Ukraine, surrounding them with your compassion and care. Fill us with loving and generous hearts to be your instruments of mercy on their behalf. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, as Bill and Faith Krug celebrate 50, their 50th wedding anniversary, accept our heartful thanks for all the blessings they have received. Let your word keep them committed to each other and to you. Continue to supply their earthly needs according to your will and give them joy in the years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, we praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness 
may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated. Good morning once again. I'm blessing to worship with you here at Our Redeemer. I direct your eyes to page 15 in the worship folder where many of the things Pastor Moldenhauer mentioned uh, coming up here in Lent are listed for you. I'll highlight just a few. This Wednesday is, the, is Ash Wednesday, and you'll notice the pattern that'll be for the rest of the Lenten season. At 5.30, we gather for a meal at 6 p.m., there's an instruction period. This year we'll be focusing on the Lord's Supper. Then at, at 7 p.m., we gather for a Lenten Vespers. Um, you might better know those as those midweek Lenten services. You're welcome to come to whatever works for your schedule, but we hope that this can be part of your, your Lenten renewal this year. Also want to point out that at the Info Center, there are some materials for you to use at home. There's a Lenten devotional booklet. Take as many as you'd like. There's a reading plan for a special Bible study that will be on the book of Genesis. These are all available to you. Again, use them as, as you can and as they work for your own schedule and your own life for this time of, of Lent. You're invited to stick around for our Bible study in the community room. That will happen at, at 9.15 um, right after the service along with Sunday school. I also want to give you an update. Um, many of you know Nick and Carrie Laper are members here at Our Redeemer and they serve in Ukraine with a medical mission. Uh, Carrie asked that I would update the congregation, letting you know they are out of Ukraine and are heading back to the United States. Please, though, keep um, the people of Ukraine in your prayers, and especially those that they've worked with, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are, many of them, left there um, as, as they carry on this work to the best of their ability in the situation. So please do keep, keep those uh, Christians in your prayer and the rest of the nation. God's blessings on the rest of your day.